This is Untangled, fly fishing for everyone. Presented by Ventures Fly Company. You know, I'm pretty sure that this winter is never going to end. And I get it, I get it. I moved to Wyoming. It's always cold here. I kind of brought this on myself. I know, I understand, I get it. But still, it is cold. And it's going to stay cold. And I just... I just kind of want to go fishing, to be honest with you. I just, <laughs> I just want to go fishing without having to pick ice out of my guides every other cast. But that's what it still is here. Hopefully, wherever you're at listening to the show, the weather's a little bit more amenable to you going out and getting some fishing done. So, hey, welcome to it today, everybody. This is Untangled, and I am your host, Spencer Durant. We've got a fantastic show on the docket for you. We're going to be talking about fly color. Whether or not fly color actually matters, all right? How to tell flies apart. This is a great question for folks who are just barely getting started. We're also going to dish some info on how to get started with different techniques in fly fishing. And then I'm going to wrap the show up with talking about one of my favorite things, fly rods. Talking about fly rod lengths and weights for different fishing applications. So whatever you do when you normally listen to the show, do that. Okay, get comfortable, get ready, because we're going to start dropping some knowledge, and some information on you, all right? And just as a reminder, before we get started, first off, thanks to everybody who takes the time to listen to the show every week, and thank you so much for submitting questions to the show. That's what makes this show go on. So if you've got any questions that are just burning a hole in your head pocket there, that that would be your brain. Uh, (laughs) If you've got any questions that just need to be answered, Go ahead, click the link in the podcast description. Go ahead, submit those questions, get them answered, all right? Thank you to everybody who's already done that and continues to do it. So our first question today comes to us uh, from Hunter from Pennsylvania. He says, how much does fly color matter uh, in my fly pattern when trying to match the hatch or with using streamers? I got your 200-piece fly box, and I see there are some yellow stone fly and other colors in there. I didn't expect to be natural. Hunter, great question. Uh, Fly color, that's something that I think we talk about a lot, especially if you're brand new to this stuff, especially if you're new to fishing in general. You see all this brightly colored stuff, and you're like, well, gee, that doesn't look like a fish, really, does it? And no, you're right. There's a lot of colors that aren't completely natural. All right, let's dive into this, though. Let's go just take your question from the top. First off, I'm stoked. Really stoked that you got that 200 fly assortment. It's a ton of fun going through that, and I'm really impressed with the fly selection that we're able to offer in that 200 fly assortment. So glad that you got that. It's tons of fun going through those flies for the first time. And like I said, you're right. You're going to see some colors that you look at that don't look really natural, and I'm going to explain that in a sec. But first... I want to dive into the heart of your question, all right? Does color matter when you're choosing your flies? The short answer to this question is not really. Unless you're on a really highly pressured river where fish see hundreds of thousands of flies a year, right? The Madison, the San Juan, the Lower Provo. And just as an aside, I rag on the Lower Provo a little bit in this podcast. I love that river. I grew up fishing there, but it's really easy to make fun of too. So I'm not trying to hate on the lower Provo. Okay. I'm not picking on it. It's I'm doing it out of love. All right. But unless you're on a really highly pressure river like that, color just really isn't going to be a big trigger for fish. In fact, there is science fact to back this up. So this isn't just me sitting here saying, Hey, don't worry about color, Hunter. And then I'm over here laughing like, <laughs> I told that guy not to worry about color. Now all these people ain't going to catch fish. <laughs> yeah, it's not what I'm doing. All right. Here to help. Remember, that's the whole point of this podcast. So uh, there is an article by a fellow by the name of Dr. Keith Jones. He's a scientist and a fish researcher with Berkeley, the folks who brought us power bait. All right. So he knows what he's doing. And I do not say that facetiously. Okay. That's a that's impressive to have that job. Right. And according to Dr. Keith Jones, color is the fourth most important trigger that a trout, quote unquote, considers when eating a fly. And of course, I say I say it like that because trout 
aren't capable of sentient thought. We know that. We have to remind ourselves of that when they refuse our flies because it makes us feel better. All right. But when they're looking at flies to eat, color is like the fourth most important thing. Now, Dr. Jones's research is quoted extensively in this great article that Bruce Ingram wrote in Fly Fisherman Magazine, and that's linked in the podcast description. So you can go to that to go more in depth on the stuff that we're going to discuss here. And just as an aside, I've been watching all the Indiana Jones flicks again lately, and I just got to say I love that this guy's name is Dr. Jones. So anyways, back to it. All right. Basically, uh, Dr. Jones's research backs up what a lot of uh, us anglers have been saying for years and kind of what we know, which is that trout react way more to a fly's shape, size, and movement than they do its color. All right. Now, it is true that a trout will turn their nose up at a fly if it's not the right color, but that instance is very rare. They are far more likely to turn their nose up at your fly if it's the wrong shape or the wrong size or if they're keyed in on a particular hatch. All right. As an example, I was in Oregon a few years ago and I was fishing this amazing blue winged olive hatch with some of my best friends. And I was resolutely trying to match the hatch. I was going to match that hatch come heck or high water, right? And I wanted to be doing that with a crippled blue wing dollop pattern because blue wings were hatching and that's what they were snacking on. So I'm sitting there and I'm going through my box. I'm like, I got to find the perfect BWO cripple and I'm going to do it and I'm going to catch so many fish. And then my buddy that I was with, one of the buddies, named Mike, he's downstream from me and he's using a Griffith snap. And he caught like 10 fish to my, to every one that I caught, he caught 10. It felt like probably wasn't that much, but that's what it felt like. <laughs> so that fly, the reason the Griffiths net was so successful for him that day, that fly was the right size, even if that color was completely off from the usual color pattern that we see on a blue winged olive, right? More importantly though, that Griffiths net provided a ton of contrast, which is what I think made the fish really eat it. And when I say contrast, that brings up another point that Dr. Jones explained in his article. Okay. What Dr. Jones said is that we should focus when we're picking colors. Okay. We should focus more on colors that contrast in our flies than we should colors that are like supernatural or flashy or whatever. We want contrast. Okay. Because the more our fly stands out from its background, the better chance there is that that fly is going to get seen by a trout and then eaten. So that's why you see some of our flies tied in such non-natural colors. Often the best color schemes for flies are the ones that provide a ton of contrast, especially since trout have a smaller field of color vision than we do as humans. They don't see all the same colors we do, all right? They're going to be playing off contrast, especially with the way light works in water. Contrast is kind of going to be what they're looking for. And again, that is all included in Dr. Jones's article. I'd highly, highly recommend you read it. It was fascinating to go through. So, uh, and then in that story, uh, in his article, a guide who was quoted uh, backs that whole concept up. The guide said, quote, I'm at least concerned with color on native brook trout streams where presentation is the most important thing. The ability to wade quietly is just as important, end quote. So, long answer here. Color doesn't matter a whole lot in fly fishing. You need to focus on matching the size and shape of the natural bugs you see in and around the water before you start worrying about the color of the bug, right? In fact, we even have an entire series on this concept over on the VFC blog, and I'll link that in the podcast description too. Hunter, that was a fantastic question to get the show started off today. And Again, I can't recommend that article from Dr. Jones enough. It really explains everything in great detail. But yeah, color is just not super important when it comes down to picking your flies. So that's why I always tell folks, kind of my credo has always been, when you're picking a fly, look for the size and then match the shape. Those are your two things. If you've got one that's the same color, perfect, tie it on. If not, throw it out there. You'll be surprised at what will happen anyways. So thank you again, Hunter. Great question. Next question on the show today is coming to us from the state home to the largest cutthroat you'll ever catch, Nevada. Joe from Nevada says, first and foremost, 
This podcast is very informative and I greatly appreciate it. My question is when looking in a fly box, how can I tell which flies are nymphs, midges, wet flies, and dry flies? Thank you in advance. Joe, thank you so much for the kind words. I really am glad that you enjoy the show and I really enjoy doing it. So thanks a bunch, Joe. Now, this is a really good question, especially if you're coming into fly fishing without any knowledge of conventional fishing to begin with. All right. If you're picking up a fly rod and it's the first fishing rod that you've ever touched in your whole life, this stuff's definitely going to be important to you. So, uh, I do want to clarify something though before we get into before we get into this. All right. You mentioned wet flies. A wet fly can mean a lot of different things. Okay, different folks are going to refer to wet flies and mean different things. It can refer to a nymph, which is any fly that imitates the pupil or larval stage of an aquatic insect or of an aquatic insect that never hatches into a winged adult. Okay, translating that into English, any bug that's fished beneath the surface of the water, we would classify as a nymph. Or, wet flies can refer to a family of flies that are tied with a soft hackle. Soft hackle flies are usually meant to imitate emergers, and they're often fished with a very specific kind of technique. I love fishing soft hackles. It's not something that I do often enough. They're a fun fly to fish. Uh, the technique's different, though, and that little soft hackle, it's tied to kind of like undulate and wave around the fly to imitate uh, you know, uh, legs that are trying to squirm out, uh, just to add movement to the fly to make it look like it's just about ready to emerge. Okay. It could be anything from an air bubble to legs to wings is what that ackle is trying to imitate there. So now in the interest of clarity though, I'm going to assume that when you, Joe, uh, say wet fly that you're probably asking about nymphs. So the easiest way to tell nymphs apart from dry flies is to look for hackle. Dry flies will have hackle, all right? And hackle is basically feathers that are wrapped around a hook so that the individual feather fibers stick straight up. This hackle helps the fly float on the surface of the water, hence the name dry fly. It sits on top. It doesn't get wet in theory. They always get wet and they sink, and then you spend a whole bunch of time dowsing it off with whatever your favorite floating is and cursing them. I can't see it. Where'd it go? Oh, it's sinking again. Yeah, fun times. <laughs> Fun times, all right? Uh, so that's how you're going to tell nymphs from dry flies. Okay, another way that you can tell them apart, nymphs are usually going to have beads on the front near the hook eye. We call these beadhead nymphs. Now, I say usually there, and some people are going to come back at me and say, oh, well, I use a bunch of weightless nymphs all the time. That's awesome. And I I use weight, uh, not weightless, that's the wrong word, uh, unweighted nymphs all the time, all right? and yeah, I'll, I'll fish an unweighted nymph myself, but that's just another way to help you identify them. If you see a bead on the front of it, it's going to be a nymph. Almost 100% certainty you're looking at a nymph if you see a bead on the front of it. All right. Now, a midge, you mentioned midge in your question there, Joe. A midge is a specific family of flies. So midges are going to have a nymph version and a dry fly version. The most famous midge nymph is the zebra midge, and that's super easy to spot. In fact, we just did a tying video today on, or not today, this week, on uh, Instagram, TikTok, basically wherever you get your tying videos from VFC. Alex put together a wonderful video on the zebra midge. So you can go take a look at what that looks like, and I'll leave a link to that in the podcast description as well. One thing that is nice in the fly packs that we sell we do have an ID card that comes with all of them. This helps you learn how to identify flies. That's a really good way to learn how to ID flies. So hopefully something in there helps you feel more confident the next time you're opening up a fly box. Maybe somebody got it for you as a gift or you're borrowing one from somebody. And if you're borrowing a fly box from somebody and it's full of flies, you better, uh, you better make sure that box is filled up before you give it back to them. Don't make the same mistake I did. <laughs> When I started out fly fishing, I'd take my dad's fly boxes and I'd go and I'd lose, you know, two, three, four, five dozen flies in an afternoon. And I'd come home and give the box back to my dad and then proceed to have a fight about uh, how I don't respect anything and how I think flies just grow on trees. And yeah, so I'm sorry. 
Dad. Sorry for all the flies I lost. I've tried to make it up to you. But, oh, gosh, it's tough. <laughs> Thanks a bunch, Joe. It was a good question. Appreciate it. Do you spend a lot of time anxious, unhappy, jittery, depressed, unable to calm your thoughts about the river? Well, we have a solution for that. All you need to do is to get those burning questions you have about fly fishing answered by somebody who has access to Google. You can do that by submitting a question about fly fishing to Untangled Fly Fishing for Everyone, where we'll do our best to answer your questions in a helpful, informative, hopefully entertaining way. So, kick the wintertime blues, get that out of your system, calm your mind, find inner peace, add knowledge, all with a simple couple clicks of a button and a few keystrokes to submit a question to Untangled Fly Fishing for Everyone. Next question, Chris from Colorado. I'm fairly new to fly fishing and am somewhat confused at techniques. What would be a good place to find info on techniques other than a fly shop, YouTube, or blogs? Would that be good? Chris, well, first off, I'll tell you, make sure you stay fishing in Colorado, all right? Uh, Certainly, the rivers are very unpressured. In fact, I'd call them almost pristine, okay? Uh, (laughs) No, Chris, I'm kidding. Uh, There's nothing wrong with the rivers in Colorado, okay? All seriousness. I've enjoyed my time fishing in Colorado, but every time I do fish there, I remember why I moved to Wyoming, because there are no fish in our rivers, so they're not crowded here. (laughs) Okay, seriously, I'll be serious, okay? Colorado's great, and a lot of people fly fish there. So I definitely understand it can feel overwhelming in a place like that where, like, everybody fly fishes. And you're the new guy coming in like, gee, I don't know what I'm doing. Can somebody help? And they're, you know, they're like, well, you need to make a pile cast over here across this seam over that tiny little pocket. Then you need to make sure that you high stick it. You got to get make sure you get a really good dead drift while you're doing that. And then you're going to want to manage your line. Make sure you have managing your line. Oh, you have too much slack line out. Oh, raise your tip. Oh, oh. And they're telling you to do all this stuff. And your eyes glaze over and you're just like, okay, well, um, I'm going to go back to something less complicated like uh, uh, rocket science or owning Twitter. Uh, whatever it is, you know, I understand the feeling of being overwhelmed by too much information, Chris. So to answer your question without any more digs at Colorado's fishing, and I would never dig at Colorado's fishing in all seriousness. They're, it's great. Yeah, you can definitely check out the VFC blog and our YouTube or TikTok page and Instagram as well for some info on techniques. There's a link to the VFC blog in the podcast description along with YouTube, TikTok, and Instagram, all right? The best thing that you can do, though, Chris, honestly, is read up on techniques and then go try them out on the water. I try my best, and any fly fishing guide or instructor that's worth their salt, uh, they're going to try their best, too, to explain things well in print, but there's just no substitute for on-the-water experience. You are going to learn way more from screwing up on the river than you are from reading or watching videos. You just have to go out there and do it. So definitely read, do some research, check out the VFC blog, check out our YouTube, our TikTok, our Instagram, and check out our weekly email too. Our weekly email is fantastic. Check all that stuff out, but then make sure you're out on the river too, because that's where you're going to learn all these lessons. That One of the fun things about fly fishing is there's a lot of intangibles to it that are really hard to teach to somebody. And that's something that I've found uh, being, you know, in the times that I've been guiding, it's, there are some folks who just kind of catch on to those intangibles and there's some folks who don't. And the folks who do are the ones who do tend to spend a lot more time out on the water. They just soak that up. It's a part of being out there. So I, I can't stress that enough. There's just, No substitute for getting out on the water and just enjoying yourself and learning as much as you can while you're out there. So thanks, Chris. That was a great question. So to end the show today, we've got a great question. Uh, It comes to us from Tim from Missouri. Tim asks, what are good starting points to look at rod lengths and line weight for different styles or types of flies and species, etc.? So Tim, I could talk about fly rods for an entire show. And one of these 
weeks, we're just going to have to dedicate an entire episode to fly rods. I think that's just going to have to happen. Uh, I love, excuse me, I love fly rods. I love gear. I'm a bit of a gear nut. I've reviewed gear for a long time. It's something that I really enjoy doing. It's how I got my start, actually, in fly fishing, writing, and kind of the media side of all this stuff was just going out and reviewing gear, rods, waders, reels, line, tippet, uh, leaders, just a- a- anything I get my hands on reviewing it. I love it, but definitely have a soft spot for fly rods. I even build bamboo fly rods, too. Uh, it's just something that I love and can really get into and talk somebody's ear off. And, you know, it's probably kind of concerning for folks that see me and they think I'm a well-adjusted person and I can go off about uh, fancy graphite sticks for hours on it. Uh, but anyways, Tim, uh, again, I, and I do say all that about, you know, like gear review stuff. Like I'm not trying to brag about that. It's been a ton of fun, but I only bring that up just because, you know, I want to give you some, some good advice and that way, you know, where the advice is coming from. All right. Uh, for standard trout fishing, okay, it is really tough in my opinion to beat the versatility the nine foot five weight fly rod offers. It's just a really good do it all stick that excels in a variety of fishing situations, which is why so many of the fly rods sold today are nine foot five weights. They just they work in so many different situations. Now a nine foot four weight's great because nine foot four weight is just a little bit softer. It's just a little bit better for dry flies. It's just a little bit lighter. It's just it has a, just a little bit more of the intangible just presentation ability. A nine foot four weight would. A nine foot six weight, on the other hand, you're going to be able to fight a lot more wind with that. You've got a little bit more pulling power on big fish. You can turn bigger rigs over easier. With the nine foot six weight, but the nine foot five, it's that Goldilocks rod, man. It just sits there in the middle and it just it's just right. It'll handle streamers, it'll handle small dry flies. It's just it's a great length and weight combo. All right. That's why we're going with a nine foot five weight for trout rods almost all the time. So uh for trout weights though, for for trout fishing, pardon me. Uh, the weights like four through six are considered standard, right? A four or five or six, that's your standard trout weights. Now, if you want a Euro Nymph, that's when you're going to be looking at like the two, threes, and fours. And those rods come in, you know, 10 to 11 feet. I've seen, I've even seen some 11 and a half foot nymphing, Euro Nymphing rods out there, but they're really long. And they're really light. Now, your like one, two, and three weight, like seven footers. Those are for trout fishing too. That's for like really small stuff, super high country, uh, backpacking into streams. You know, the streams maybe two feet wide at its most. You're catching like maybe a 10 inch fish would be your biggest. Uh, that's kind of where your, your, your ones, twos, and three weights are really going to shine. Now, I know folks who love fishing their three weights on bigger water, and I tip my hat to them. Uh, I don't know how they're able to, you know, get their fly rods to do some of the things that they need to on bigger water with a three weight, but that's kind of where your three weight typically is going to fall performance wise. Okay. Uh, for fishing big lakes, a seven weight is really hard to beat because of its uh, power and ease of casting. I really love seven weights. Uh, in fact, when I go out to pyramid Lake, for example, I fish a seven weight out of pyramid uh, even though I'm not usually fishing bugs that are bigger than like a size 10 coronamid. All right. But this brings us back to kind of the, the place, I guess you should start, which is that a general rule of thumb is to match the weight of the fly rod to the size of fly that you're casting and the size of fish that you're trying to catch. If you know, you're going to spend all day fishing a hatchery and there's only 10 pound fish in the hatchery. Your five weight's probably going to be a little undergunned, all right? You probably want a six or a seven if you know that's what you're going to be getting into all day. Now, if you know you're going to be throwing big streamers all day, that's another instance where you'd want maybe a six or maybe even a seven, depending on where that's going to be. If you're going to be fishing a small stream, the trout, a big trout would be like a 20-incher, 
and you don't really need to reach a lot to fish pockets or to high stick a lot, yeah, pick up an eight foot four weight and just go to town. Have a ton of fun, right? Conversely, if you're going to be fishing dry flies all day, maybe you want an eight or eight and a half foot four weight. It's just a little bit softer. It gives you a little bit more delicate presentation. But what I'm doing there is I'm matching the fly rod, the length and weight to the use that I need for it out there on the water and the fish that I'm planning on catching. That little river in Oregon I was talking about earlier in the show where I was fishing with my buddy Mike, uh, that's a that's a weird place because you will get like 22, 23 inch brown trout rising to dry flies. It's pretty pretty unique where they'll come up and do that. And I will fish like a a three weight out there sometimes because you need such a delicate presentation and the water can be so flat and calm that even a five can be a little much. So I'll fish a three sometimes and in those instances. So there there will be times that exist where you're going to kind of stray from this formula a little bit, but this is what you generally want to try and do. You want to try and match what you're doing on the water, the flies that you're fishing, and the fish, and then you match that to your length and weight of rod. So another example would be if you're going to go chase musky or pike, you want a seven or an eight weight for musky and pike. Especially those those are big streamers you're tossing for those things. You want a big fly rod that'll handle those streamers. Now, as far as rod lengths go, without getting too much into the weeds of fly rod design and how the length of a rod affects its action, the length of a rod for most anglers is going to be dependent on where you fish. I have some really short rods that I use on small water. Like, again, those like one to two foot wide, tiny little streams up in the high country. These rods are perfect for that. But I don't tend to fish with much of anything that's shorter than seven feet because it's just tougher to reach to make some casts. It's tougher to to stick yourself through a pocket if you need to when you have a rod that's shorter than seven feet, especially if the water is super clear or the fish are really, really spooky. So I would say as a general rule of thumb, don't go shorter than seven feet unless you're on really, really small water. And again, match the size of the fly to and the fish that you plan on catching to the length and weight of the fly rod that you're going to pick up. So hopefully that was helpful and we can definitely dive into fly rods more. I think we're definitely going to have to in a later episode. Uh, and speaking of later episodes, Uh, Thank you to everybody who's tuned in so far and left questions for me to answer on the show. Really appreciate it. The whole team here at Ventures Fly Co., we just, we love seeing this support. It really does make our day. So if you do have a question that needs to be answered, go ahead, click the link in the podcast description, get that submitted. And until next time, tight lines, everybody.